If you are joining us for the first time this morning, we are at the very end of a six-week series called Summer at the Movies, Finding God on Film. And all throughout this series, we have been discussing various Hollywood films and how they relate to our faith as Christians. In the first week of this series, we discussed the importance of taking leaps of faith with the movie Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. In our second week together, we discussed the power of sin and how it causes death and division as seen in the movie Raya and the Last Dragon. In our third week, we witnessed the power of sacrificial love as seen in the movie Frozen. In our fourth week, we talked about grief and the ways that God often answers our prayers through people with the movie Black Panther Wakanda Forever. And last week, we talked about how there is life after loss with the Pixar movie Up. This morning, we are ending our series with the movie The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. And yet again, Antonia Craighill knocked it out of the park with this amazing um, shire. This is the shire where the hobbits live. So um, for those of you who have not seen the film, this is a part of a trilogy, a fantasy film based in the fictional land of Middle Earth, where an evil ring is created to destroy all of the world. In a battle between good and evil, the dark lord Sauron is defeated, and a king takes the ring from him. But just when you think the story is over three minutes into the movie, the movie is like three hours, so you're like, three minutes, oh, okay, it's over. Um, the ring tempts King Isildur with his power, and the king decides to keep the ring for himself instead of destroy it. So what do you think happens? Nothing good, right? Uh, the ring starts to corrupt this mortal king, and not only corrupts him, but uh, kills him in the end. And at this point, the ring is lost in a river for over 2,000 years. And after a creature named Gollum discovers the ring, then an unsuspecting hobbit named Bilbo Baggins finds the ring for himself and keeps it, not knowing its dark history. Bilbo realizes he doesn't age. He kind of feels more strong and powerful, but is affected by the evil power of the ring too. And so on Bilbo's 110th birthday, A wise wizard named Gandalf the Grey discovers the ring and realizes what's going on. He tells the team that the ring must be destroyed once and for all, and so he tasks Bilbo's nephew Frodo, a young hobbit, to be the bearer of the ring and to take the ring to the fires of Mordor, which is the only place it can be destroyed. Sending Frodo off on this quest with a group of friends to care for him and protect him, this film explores the biblical themes of true sacrifice, commitment, friendship, the struggle and battle between good and evil, but most of all, the commitment it takes when we pursue the things we value the most. And that's what I want to talk about today is that idea of commitment and priorities. Frodo embarks on a perilous quest to destroy this ring that threatens the future of all of Middle Earth. And Frodo and his friends, the Fellowship, recognize the value in this dangerous mission. So they leave behind the safety and comforts of their homes in the Shire and confront numerous dangers along the way, knowing this quest is of the utmost importance. The future and the safety of the world, the fate of all that is good, is left in their hands. Now, as Christians, we are called to similar levels of devotion and sacrifice. Following Jesus requires serious commitment and determination, and we see this in our scripture reading today. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open them to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. 
This is the parable of the pearl of great price in verses 45 and 46 from the New International Version of the Bible. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sometimes my scripture readings are really long, so that's one for you. You're welcome. Um, (laughs) The parable of the pearl of great price is one of the many, many parables that Jesus gave and taught on when he was spending his ministry here on earth. Christ taught with parables often because he wanted his audience to think critically, question their motives, grow in their faith, and gain insight into the kingdom of heaven. And for the majority of my life, I was taught that this particular parable was just a simple allegory on the sacrificial cost of discipleship. The merchant always symbolized a person who chooses the kingdom of heaven. The pearl always symbolized the gospel. And the moral of the story was that we have to sacrifice everything to follow Jesus. And yes, sacrifice is definitely part of this lesson that Christ is teaching us, but there's so much more happening in this parable. And to properly understand it, we have to be able to look at it with the lens of a first century Jewish person. Because this was Christ's original audience. So we miss a lot of the provocative nature of what Christ is challenging us with when we're not able to really understand the context of where this parable was given. I want to thank author and biblical scholar Amy Jill Levine for all of her wisdom on this parable and all of Christ's parables. The commentary that I read and reread um, on this particular parable this week came from her research. And Amy teaches us that a Jewish person living in the first century would have not seen this as a simple allegory. They would have unpacked this parable that Christ taught bit by bit, turning it like a precious gem, realizing that it is so multifaceted with all kinds of wisdom to teach us. They would have started with what they knew about merchants and then pondered what they knew about pearls. Now, here's where things get strange. The Greek word used for the man in the story is emporos, which means wholesaler. So this merchant would have spent his career selling customers things they didn't need at prices they couldn't afford. What does that sound like, right? And And comparing the kingdom to a merchant of any sort would have been a tough sell for Jesus at this time. Just like yeast had a lot of negative connotations to Jews in the first century, so did merchants. So the only other place the word emporos appears in the New Testament is in the book of Revelation, where a merchant is weeping and mourning because no one is buying their goods of gold, silver, and slaves. Merchants have a similar negative meaning in the Old Testament, too. In Genesis 23, the empori sells Joseph into slavery. So they weren't really known as noble, moral people. Like, what is Jesus saying, right? And then there's the fact that the merchant is selling and seeking, right? What would Jewish people living at the time of Christ know about fine pearls? Well, in many allegorical readings, the pearl was always seen to be the most desirable thing a person could have. According to Roman author Pliny, pearls were the topmost rank among all things of value, far above even rubies. So it makes sense that many commentators and pastors throughout the years have compared this pearl to Jesus or the gospel of Christ, as I said earlier. But if we read this parable a little slower, we will see that the parable doesn't compare the kingdom of heaven to a pearl. The kingdom of heaven is compared to the merchant who, seeking fine pearls, sells all that he has for one of great value. And that brings us to the merchant's radical and absurd behavior. This man sells all that he has, everything, for just one pearl. 
And when we think about what everything means, I want us to think it's probably more than just the other jewelry he had. It would have been his house, his horse, maybe his family, everything to buy that pearl. At this point, his actions have transformed his identity. He's no longer a merchant, right? He's now just a guy with a pearl and nothing else. This is the point of the parable, loved ones. The kingdom of heaven is not simply the merchant or the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is the transformation that comes after. It's the action the merchant took to stop at nothing until he attained the object of his greatest desire. It is the fact that this merchant knew what he wanted and he did whatever he needed to do to obtain it, realizing it meant prioritizing some things and sacrificing others to achieve his goal. That's the point of the parable. He was laser-focused, and it forever changed him, his purpose, his identity. That is the powerful transformation when we seek the pearl of greatest price in our lives. So the thing that is so challenging about this parable, this short, seemingly simple parable, is that Jesus is asking all of us, what is our pearl of greatest price? Is it our health and our beauty? Is it our family, our career, our wealth and our material possessions? Or is that our relationship with Christ? In the movie, one of Frodo's companions is a man named Boromir, and Boromir says he's going to support and protect Frodo so that they can complete this mission and destroy the ring at Mordor, but Boromir's actions say otherwise. All throughout the film, Boromir is jealous of Frodo and tempted with the power the ring holds. He wants the ring for himself. He wants to be the leader and ruler of Middle-earth. So in this clip, Boromir is taken over by greed and sin and tries to take the ring from young Frodo. What have you become a strength? Pay no heed to that, Lord. Where's Frodo? None of us should wander alone. You least of all. So much depends on you. Frodo? I know why you seek solitude. You suffer. I see it day by day. You sure you do not suffer needlessly? There are other ways, Frodo. Other paths that we might take. I know what you would say. And it would seem like wisdom, but for the warning in my heart. Warning? Against what? We're all afraid, Frodo. But to let that fear drive us to destroy what hope we have. Don't you see? That is madness. There is no other way. I ask only for the strength to defend my feet. Lend me the ring. No. Why do you recoil? I am no thief. You are not yourself. What chance do you think you have? They will find you. They will take the ring. And you will beg for death before the end. Go. It is not your save by unhappy chance. It could have been mine. It should be mine. Okay, that's good, Russ. Thank you.
sacrifice was not destroying the ring like he said it was. It was not being a team player for the greater good of all humanity. It was keeping the ring for himself. That is what we see he really cares about. A lot of the time we say we value certain things, but if we take an honest look at our hearts, oftentimes we realize we are fooling ourselves. We can say we value our health, but if we're really honest, we'll admit that, well, we don't really drink a lot of water and we never get enough sleep and we're always eating poorly and we never take time to exercise, right? We can say that we're prioritizing the relationships in our life, but if we're really honest, we don't take the time to connect with the people that we love. We spend way too much time working, and when we are with our loved ones, we're zoned out or on our phones, right? The same goes with our faith. We can say that we value our faith, but when we're honest, Sometimes we have to admit that we haven't prioritized it in a long time. We haven't contributed to the ministry of the church. We haven't participated in any of the missions that God has invited us into. We haven't carved out time in our schedules to pray or read scripture. It's easy to discover what's most important to us when we look at two things. How we spend our time and how we spend our money. So our checking accounts, our credit card statements, our weekly schedules, the things that consume our thoughts, that is what we are prioritizing. That is what we value. And if what we are prioritizing isn't transforming us to be the best disciples we can be for the kingdom of heaven, then are we really committed to following Christ or are we just saying we are? In the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, we see a powerful illustration of how hard it can be to follow Jesus. Being a Christ follower is not a casual endeavor, but a radical transformation that happens all throughout our lives. Jesus, um, just as the sorry, just as the merchant sacrificed everything to obtain the pearl of greatest price. We, too, are called to give up anything that might compete with our devotion to the Lord. We have the opportunity every day to participate in the work of bringing the kingdom of heaven here to earth, of visiting the sick, of caring for the needy, of bringing justice to the marginalized, of sheltering the poor. We have the ability to partner with Jesus in what he is already doing in our church, in our community, and in our world, but we have to be willing to make it a priority. A few years ago, one of my friends, that is also a Methodist pastor in this conference, started a church plant in the suburbs of Denver for addicts and loved ones of addicts called Free. Ryan Canada started this church because he was a newly recovering alcoholic himself. And for many, many years, his pearl of great price was drinking. And like anything we value and prioritize, it consumed his thoughts. Drinking drained his bank account, and his addiction kept him from spending time with his wife, his kids, and yes, even his church. When Ryan valued his addiction to alcohol more than anything else, it transformed him into an ineffective pastor, a distant spouse, and an unsupportive dad. His days were filled with secrecy and shame. He didn't want anyone to know what he was struggling with until the day on January 8th when he finally accepted the strength that Christ had been offering him. And he went to an AA meeting and uttered the words, My name is Ryan and I am an alcoholic. Ryan recently celebrated 10 years of sobriety and continues to transform his life into the best disciple of Christ he can be, the best pastor, the best Christ follower, the best dad and friend and spouse. 
In 2018, he and his wife Tammy started the ministry free in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, and this little church plant now ministers to thousands of people on a weekly basis. Ryan shifted his priorities, and through it, he received his calling from Christ to help others find freedom from their addiction and help others find healing from God, no matter how messy and broken their lives are. Ryan's testimony has been so powerful to me and to so many who he shared it with because it demonstrates that it's never too late to reassess what we're going to value. It's never too late for us to reframe our lives and restructure our priorities. So if you're here this morning and you are far from prioritizing the right things, a relationship with Jesus being at the top, remember that God's grace is never ending and God doesn't do shame. God just does love and constant invitations. He is always inviting us to step into freedom and step away from the things that keep us chained down, away from the abundant life he has for us. The pearl of greatest price is not just something that we get to go after and search for on our own, but the beautiful thing is it is something that we can go on a quest with with loved ones. Towards the end of the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo is very discouraged and defeated. The Fellowship of Companions has been broken apart by the corrupting influence of this evil ring and the dangerous challenges they have had to endure. Frodo feels like he is a threat and a liability to his friends as the ring bearer, and he decides he can spare them all by going on the journey to Mordor alone. So he heads down the river, intent to spare his loved ones from the danger of this quest. But someone comes after him. Let's take a look. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. Those are all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All you will have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. Go back, Sam! I'm going to Mordor alone. Of course you are! And I'm coming with you! You can't oh. swim! I made a promise, Mr. Frodo. A promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to. I'm Sam.
I'll need a friend like Samwise Gamgee. He's just the best. This is one of my favorite scenes, not just in this movie, but in any movie, because when we think about our commitment to Christ, when we think about discipleship, the beauty of it is we don't have to go on the journey alone. Not only are we with Jesus, but Christ gives us so many companions and faithful friends to go along with us, to support us. Jesus gave us two major commandments, to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And in this parable, the truth is we cannot fully love our neighbor if we don't know what our neighbor's pearl of great price is for them. So as we are reprioritizing our lives, as we are looking at what we value and going after it, we are called to help listen and support our loved ones and our neighbors too. Just like Sam carried the burden of the ring with Frodo all the way to Mordor, we are invited to carry the burdens of our neighbors as well. To listen to them and to love them, to be generous with them and invest our time and our energy with them so that not only we are transformed, but they are transformed as well. In the last scene, Frodo laments that he wishes he never even got the ring. He wishes none of this had ever happened. And Gandalf tells him, so do all who live to see such time. But that is not for them to decide. All you have to decide, Frodo, is what you will do with the time that is given to you. So I want to leave you with that, loved ones. The same goes for us. We get to decide what we are going to do with the time given to us. Are we going to waste this one precious life on wealth and power, on earthly fleeting things that really don't matter in the end? Or are we going to spend our time investing and advancing the kingdom of heaven with Christ and our church family? As we leave this sanctuary, may our hearts be stirred with a renewed sense of commitment to the pursuit of Christ's call. May our lives be marked by the sacrifice of Jesus, unwavering faith, and a relentless call that Christ invokes in us, giving us transformation and love. And may we remember that wherever we are called to go, we never walk alone. Amen.